Welcome to the Femininja Project. I am your host, Cheryl I Love, middle-aged ninja hiding in plain sight, dedicated to restoring human dignity one person at a time and helping you unleash your personal power. Discover that it's possible to look like a woman, act like a lady, move like a ninja, and think like a warrior. And remember, men are always welcome on the Femininja Project. I have a lovely guest with me today, and I would just like to welcome her to the show. So, Tori Ivanic, welcome to the Femininja. Thanks, Cheryl. It's great to be here. I am so glad we finally got you here. <laughs> <laughs> me too. So, you have a fascinating story. There's a lot to it. So, I'm just going to start by telling the audience that you are a physician's assistant and also a homeopathy, certified homeopathy... Uh. Practitioner? Homeopath, yes. Homeopath. A classical homeopath, correct. Okay, so tell us a little bit about your journey and how you became a physician's assistant and how you segued into homeopathy, which I think is wonderful because I love the natural healing. Everybody knows that if they've been listening to my podcast. You're also a gymnast or you were a world-class gymnast. <laughs> so I'm just going to say, take it away, Tori. Sure. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, so yes, I did gymnastics from the age of three wow. till I was 16. And so gymnastics was really a huge part of my life as a child. And it then lended towards, well, what am I going to do with myself? By high school, I was still doing gymnastics, but it was causing a lot of pain. Um, and I really, I was good at sciences and that was back in the, the you know, late 80s, early 90s, mm -hmm. where if you were a woman and you were good at science, then you had to go into science. Oh, wow. You That's know, great. Things, right? Like they were pushing kind of like, oh, you're, you're female and you can do math and science. You should do that. So I kind of felt a push there. I was really strong academically and I was in pain. Honestly, I had low back pain. I had joint pain from gymnastics. And then when I was about 15 or maybe 16, I was sleeping all the time and oh. just, I mean, I'd go, I'd go to school, I'd come home, I'd take a nap, I'd go to practice, I'd come home, I'd try and get my homework done and then I'd fall asleep. You know, mm -hmm. I just was so fatigued. And so I ended up getting diagnosed with hypothyroidism mm -hmm. as a teenager. And so I was kind of involved in the medical field because I was using it a lot. I was also going to a chiropractor a lot for the back pain, for gymnastics. Mm -hmm. And so... My coach, my gymnastics coach was studying to be a chiropractor and I just kind of got led down that road. So in undergraduate, I did pre-med so that I had some options mm -hmm. um, and I got into chiropractic college. But at that point I was 22 and I was like, I'm not going straight to school. So I, I took a year off and I moved to Colorado and became a ski bum in the mountains oh, for a year. Oh, good for you. How fun. Going from being a world-class gymnast to a ski bum. That, that had to have been liberating. <laughs> I'm not sure I was world-class gymnast, but I was a good gymnast. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, the ski bum year turned into three years because at the end of that year, I was like, I was really interested in chiropractic college, but I wasn't really interested in starting my own business afterwards and having mm -hmm. all this student loan debt. And so I started looking at other options and physician assistant, the name of mm -hmm. the profession always turned me off. I didn't want to be somebody's assistant, right? Yeah. But when you really look at what a physician assistant or a nurse practitioner does, mm -hmm. they have a ton of autonomy. And so I got clear on like, that would be a good role. I knew I wanted to have kids. And so my third year in Breckenridge, I worked at a family practitioner's office as a medical assistant and loved it. Loved the relationship that was formed in a good small family practice setting. Mm -hmm. So that's what led me to PA school. And I went to PA school in Arizona. And by that time, I was a rock climber too. So I was loving rock climbing. And so at 26, Six or 27 when I graduated from PA school the only place that I applied for jobs was where there was really good rock climbing <laughs> I love it <laughs> so you started the rock climbing as an adult then and yeah. what about skiing was that something that you that you discovered as an adult because I would imagine as a gymnast and practice and all of your responsibilities as a gymnast would kind of limit you as far as yeah. being able to get on the slopes well I was in Ohio too so there aren't many slopes there but I did oh. <laughs> ski as a child I my mom was great she would always take us at least once a year to these little tiny mountains in Ohio and we'd go skiing and then I had the privilege of having like a ski club in my middle school so 
for an Ohioan, yeah, I got mm-hmm. out and I skied a decent amount, you know, mm-hmm. a couple times a year. And so I loved skiing, but it hadn't been very accessible to me, which is why when I went to Breckenridge just to, you know, to travel and play my senior year in college, I fell in love with the mountains as much as the skiing. And mm-hmm. so that's what took me there. Yeah. Well, I learned how to ski in Pennsylvania in the Allegheny Mountains, yeah. you know, and the same thing. But we had, I think, a lot more accessibility than you did in Ohio. And we, I still laugh about it. One of my sisters who was an excellent skier and on the Penn State ski team, we laugh about the bulletproof ice, you know, yes. and you really learn how to use your edges. So I learned uh, when I was nine years old. And then mm-hmm. that's one of the main reasons why I moved out here after college. And the first time I went skiing in college, Colorado was like, oh, I think I died and went to heaven. I'm never skiing anywhere else again. I know. It's a whole new world here. Yeah. So that's been great. And skiing and climbing were really my focus those few years. You know, I was working jobs typically that I didn't love that much. I was coaching gymnastics, which I liked, Mm -hmm. um, but basically just kind of taking jobs to pay the bills and get by and, and right. really focus on skiing and climbing. And then I started playing hockey then too. And oh, just how kind of fun is that? I can't playing. believe that. Yeah. 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 So it must've been quite the liberating to be able to do that and have control over your own schedule and your own life and to be able to do things that you could have fun with and not have to, you know, reach a certain perform. Exactly. Yes. Absolutely. 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 It was, it was, it was very, it was good years for me. I, I look back now and I realize so many of my friends never learned how to play. Yeah. And those were my years where I learned how, if I have time off, this is how I want to spend it. These are the things I love to do and got good enough at them where, you know, I can, I can hang, you know, it's yeah. fun. Oh, that's so, wonderful. Yeah. My play years. Yeah. Well. yeah. Yeah. Well, you're still kind of playing. Oh yeah. Yeah, Working sure. and playing, but we'll yes, get into that too definitely. in a little bit. So then you did go to PA school, mm-hmm. and when you came back, you and so I then I applied for jobs in mm-hmm. good climbing areas, and I <laughs> and I landed a job two and a half hours south of Yosemite Valley in California, okay. which and and there's all kinds of other climbing near there, but the. The clincher for me for this job, it was a rural and underserved area, so I was going to get loan repayment for it, which was amazing. But the MD at this, it was in just a small family practice in a little town called Three Rivers that was um, 3,500 people, so tiny oh, little wow. town. And this doctor had had his own private practice, but this corporation had bought him out because he was a homeopath. So he had been doing homeopathy for about 20 years at least before I came on board, mm-hmm. and I was really attracted to the alternative side of things. Like mm-hmm. even though I didn't go to chiropractic college, I didn't really love Western medicine and doling out drugs at everything. Mm-hmm. So the fact that I could take this job, my first job out of PA school and be with a doctor who had this much experience in homeopathy and learn from him was phenomenal. It, it's, it's, I mean, like I had an experience that none of my PA friends had where I had a true mentorship mm-hmm. with an MD that taught me a, a totally different skill than I hadn't learned in PA school. And even just watching your expressions, your facial expressions and your body language when you're talking about this, I'm kind of getting that it was a life altering experience. Absolutely. In like, a good way. It was such an amazing experience. Yeah. I didn't realize it at the time quite, quite as, you know, like clearly as I can now, mm-hmm. because I know in the Western medical world, you know, hardly any PAs and MDs even really have that much, um, interaction, right. especially in a family practice setting, because PAs pr- pretty much just treat their own clients, treat their own patients, you know, mm-hmm. and with him, those first couple years, um, it takes a while for a small town to accept a new provider. <laughs> yes. So I was pretty, you know, slow. I didn't have a lot of my own patients. So I would go in and sit in on homeopathic interviews with him and learn straight from him. But I also did a two-year certification in classical homeopathy during that time. So I was out, you know, I was studying the didactics of it while I was learning hands-on from him. Wow. Yeah, it was phenomenal. So then you worked as a PA. I mean, how long did you stay in that practice with him? In that same practice, about eight years. Okay. Um, and one of those years, I took like a gap year. I took a year off and traveled with my husband and mm-hmm. my dog in an RV and climbing. But then <laughs> I course. came back to continue working with him. And unfortunately, he had been diagnosed with cancer on that year. Oh. So I got to kind of help him with the transition. Um, but then he passed away, you know, not long after oh. I got pregnant with my second child. So he was, he covered my maternity leave when I had my first child mm-hmm. and I covered his open heart surgery. And it was oh. just this really 
like father figure kind yeah. of tight relationship. A beautiful mentorship and collaboration. Absolutely. I'm oh. so sorry, but yes. I'm so happy that you had that. It was amazing. And because what an experience for you and what a way to get started on your career. Yes, yes. I mean, I couldn't have asked for more. Yeah. Now looking, you know, everything, when you're in it, you don't really appreciate it for what exactly. it is. But looking back, I'm like, wow, what a cool thing. And then... You know, I, I, so I knew how to do homeopathic medicine, but I was also really, you know, happy with Western medicine on some levels too. So I was doing them both together. But then as he passed away, homeopathy just doesn't really fit in the Western medical model. You mm-hmm. can't do it in 15, 20 minutes. It just doesn't work. So I Guess what? Up... You can't do really good Western medicine either in 15 exactly. or 20 minutes, but that's what we're reduced that's to what these we're days. we're reduced to, exactly. Which is so sad. It is. It's a hard system right now. Yeah, it um, is. Which is why I'm not practicing that mm-hmm. anymore. But I separated my two practices. So mm-hmm. I established my own just specifically homeopathic practice mm-hmm. after he passed away. And that was how I got into the world of entrepreneurship and mm-hmm. owning my own business. Mm-hmm. So. And you do have a really lovely business. <laughs> yes, I and, love my business. It, it's, and it's great. And I think that a lot more... People are more drawn now to homeopathy, to naturopath, to a lot of different alternative healing medicines or healing systems because of being let down by the medical profession. And, you know, and I can say that I was a respiratory therapist for 17 years and a, you know, tradition, well, Mm -hmm. I was only a traditional PT for about two and a half. It just didn't work out so well for me uh, before I went on my own to do my own alternative type of thing. But I think that people are now more aware of some of the options that they have in medicine and in taking charge of their health. And that's one of the reasons that I do have a lot of alternative practitioners on the Femininja show. So they can learn about it and just know that they have options. So I just think it's wonderful what you're doing. And you started your practice or your homeopathy business and the name was Homeopathy first. Yes, homeopathy so, first. So now uh, you just told me that you're going through a rebranding and that there's a lot going on in your life right now. So just once again, take it away, Tori. Yes, thank you. Um, so homeopathy first was actually like it was amazing for me. I started it when I had little babies and, and it allowed me all this freedom. But a few years into it, I, I realized I am running a business and I never studied anything about business. <laughs> And so I was looking towards possibly going and getting an MBA. Like that's where my brain is like, okay, Mm -hmm. you go get a business degree if you don't know what. But I found it was probably the first and only ad I've ever clicked on in Facebook. Uh But it was this thing called the Good Life Project Immersion. And it was a seven month align your business with your life module. And it started out with five days in Costa Rica. And I was like, well, that sounds like way more fun than going and getting an MBA. (laughs) So I signed up for it and it was the first significant like business development and self-development mm-hmm. course that I ever tried and it pretty much changed everything because I learned about masterminding in mm-hmm. that and I fell in love with that. I think that was one of the things that I really missed in a one-on-one practice mm-hmm. and in allopathic medicine and Western medicine, you're not allowed to say, oh, you have this disease and she has this disease and you actually should know each other so you can support right. each other. You're not allowed to divulge that, which I absolutely understand, but I also think it's a weakness, right? right. Like we need to empower people to help one another. Mm-hmm. So masterminding, while I wasn't going to use it in my homeopathic practice, like to connect other you know, clients necessarily, I loved the idea of putting women together or business owners together to help each other. Mm-hmm. I really love circular learning and circular teaching. Mm-hmm. And so I learned about masterminding. I wanted to run masterminds. So I took a course on how to run masterminds. I brought that into my business. Mm-hmm. I started doing some workshops that were more group oriented and not mm-hmm. just one-to-one care. And that all sort of also led to me writing my memoir. Mm -hmm. Um, So right before that immersion group, um, a pastor at my, at my church got arrested on a lot of counts of um, rape with teenagers. Oh, Oh. yes. And so that ripped a bandaid off for me with my Uh own personal story, Uh which we haven't touched on yet. No, we haven't. (laughs) Um, So take it away but before I even talk about we talk about that um, as far as the masterminding yes it, there is magic that happens when Absolutely. you have a group that gets together and it's not like you know oh well you have the same thing that this person has so the two, two of you should talk it's almost like when you are in a small group and you learn so much about each other and then things just start to come out and they 
you know, it, it's a growing experience and a, a learning experience. And you, and you truly embody the lifelong learning model, which I think is wonderful because if we're not learning, then we're just dying. Absolutely. So, I totally agree. And the other cool thing that I see in a mastermind group is the way people can mirror each other's strengths. Yes. And, and really not lift each other up in a superficial way, like really point out to that person all the stuff that they take for granted mm -hmm. that they're not seeing. And, and I really think, yeah, there is a, an interesting power that comes to a small group mastermind. It's really hard to see yourself objectively. Mm -hmm. And because we've got our history, our stuff, we've got that chatter in our head, all that negative self-talk that we, you know, goes back, back years and years and years. And when somebody else points that out to us, like, look at what you've done and how amazing this is. And you're like, really? You know, but it's funny because I've done that even with other authors, other writers, you know, I'll have, I'll be struggling in writing something about myself, a bio or whatever. And they'll just say, well, send it to me. And it's like, oh, well, this is easy to do blah, 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 blah. Why didn't I see that? But then they're right. saying the same thing. They need help. So we'll just do editing for each other. And Absolutely. it's just so amazing to get that input from somebody else who sees you mm -hmm. from a different perspective than how you see yourself. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, so you... Give us a time frame when this happened with the pastor, right? And you just finished like starting doing all the mastermind. What year was this? 2015. So oh, the spring, recent. Yeah, fairly recently. So spring of 2015. I'm happily running my little homeopathic practice. I have two little ones. I have a five year old and a three year old at that uh -huh. point, and we hadn't actually gone. My husband and I, neither one of us had gone to church for a long time. But when we had kids, we wanted to kind of get them into mm -hmm. a spiritual home. It was a Christian church. We loved a lot of the people there. I didn't know this person all that well, and he was never with my kids or anything. But when that happened, it it really showed me that even as a mama bear that no yeah. like it's like on top of things, my radar didn't go off as much as I wished it would have. Like mm -hmm. I, it just really it shook me, mm -hmm. and then I started looking back at at just my story, and and by that time this was. Um, almost 10 years. It was nine years after I had gone to the police about my story. Okay. So I had that healing, what I had thought was big healing. You know, my right. perpetrator was in prison. I had a whole lot of time since then, mm -hmm. but now in the role of a mother with children yeah. and seeing that Boy, it that just changes still goes things. on, it really does. And it also, because it was so similar, 30 uh -huh. year old teenagers, uh -huh. multiple, multiple victims, in a position um, of authority, people look up yeah, to them, people yeah. listen to them, that type of exactly. thing. So go ahead and tell us what happened to you. Okay. So um, when I, well, so as a gymnast at a high level, you know, you're really in the gym a lot. And mm -hmm. my parents divorced when I was about 11-ish. Uh -huh. Okay. And so I was in the gym a lot already, but then my parents divorced and it was kind of my safe place, right? Mm -hmm. The gym was this place where I had been all my life. It was the thing that didn't change, you know. It when was my, home. Right. It was it was a much more of a home than what my home had become, right? Uh -huh. Because my home had split. I had to move. Um, so I was really struggling for a few years there. And that was right around the time that I got put up on the highest level team too. And so the coach on that team, his name was Greg. He was a younger guy, you know, mm -hmm. he was probably, when I was 11, he would have been 26 and he was fun and he was just the charismatic, like they called him Mr. Wonderful, you know, just this person that everyone was drawn to and everyone wanted to spend time with and everybody loved, you know? Mm -hmm. And so he, you know, at first was just really great at saying, you know, how you doing? How's your dad? How's your brother? You know, like what he just talked to me and he listened to me mm -hmm. And a few years in, maybe when I was about 13, um, I had a good friend who was a year older than me and she was getting ready to quit. She wasn't sure she was going to make it. Um, but we were at her house one time and she told me, she confided in me kind of as a warning, like, hey, just so you know, Greg is involved with Samantha. Um, and I don't know how she would have said it at the time, right. right? Like, did she say sleeping with or did she say dating or whatever. I don't know how she would have, what words she would have used, but the infer the, the message that I got was they are together in a romantic relationship. And Samantha would have been a year older than me. Ugh. So she would have been 14 at the time, maybe 15, just based on like a year and a half or right. so. And he would have been 28 or so. So I knew this 
from the age of around 13. And at that same time, he started talking to me about sex, you know, just gradually, just even saying like, oh, can I touch your abs? Can I, you know, can I feel your abs? Like just, yeah. you know, comments on my body and subtle, like joking around type of things. He and was grooming you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So fast forward, another year goes by and Samantha herself tells me her story. We were away at a camp and she confided in me mm -hmm. that yes, we're together and at that time, he he was dating another coach at the gym. So it was definitely secret, right? This was not a public knowledge thing. Um, and then she confided in me, and she was like the high level, like one of the best gymnasts in the gym. Kind mm -hmm. of, I felt, I loved her. You know, I looked up to her. She was a big sister kind of person, but I also felt kind of intimidated by her. Uh -huh. So I felt like she confided in me and let me into the secret. And so I was, you know, I was in now, right? Right. So then he's still talking to me about sex. I have my first boyfriend when I'm 15 and he's asking questions that I, you know, now looking back, I'm like, how did I even have a straight face when he's talking to me about these things, you know? But in a gymnastics center, there's a lot of places where you can be alone with a coach. You know, the vault is kind of a classic place, right? Because all the gymnasts are at the end of the vault runway and right. the coach is the only one down at the vault. So when he's spotting, like he would graze his hand up my chest and be like, oh, I'm just trying to get some at practice, you know? Like these Ugh. little subtle things, like is he kidding or is he not kidding? Right. And is does he, you know, and he always, always tells me he loves me. Like, I love you. You know, you're one of the smartest girls on the team. I can always talk to you about everything. You're, you're just building, building, building me up and grooming, grooming, grooming. Mm -hmm. But you know, the thing that I always felt was like, yeah, but he's with her, you know, mm -hmm. he's with Samantha and he's dating this woman. Mm -hmm. So fast forward, try and make this long story. Cause it's a very long story and you can read the book if you want to. Oh, and uh, we, we will be plugging the book, <laughs> but when I was 15, it was my last year in gymnastics. Like I said, I was in a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. um, and it was spring season. I knew that that Greg, my coach, was going to be moving away because he was going to chiropractic college. And I had just kind of made up my mind this was my last season because I, I didn't think I could do it for six more years through college. So If you're in that much pain at the age of 15. 15, right? So my final meet, like I should have qualified for nationals time and time again. And I'd always screw up. And it was so frustrating because I'd do beam routine after beam routine at practice. And then in the meets, I'd fall, you know? And so this is my final meet. And I think the week before, my parents had had some, you know, big fight at church and just like ugly stuff Ugh. that knocked my, you know, mental state out. And I fell, you know, I fell a bunch of times on the beam. And so I didn't qualify to nationals. And it was my last chance. And I was just obliterated, you know what I mean? Just crying and just couldn't get it together. Devastated. Devastated. Yeah. I mean, like if I could have just gone out on a good note, you yeah. know, like it's hard enough to put that much of your energy and yeah. your time into one sport and you're a teenager and you feel like you're giving up your whole world, you know, like if I could have gone out on a good note, right? but it wasn't. And so I was a wreck and I was actually driving home with Greg and Samantha. So the three of us, right? Like sitting in a car together. And, and at this point he's holding my hand. We've got a blanket on top of us cause the heater was broken or something. But I go into this rest stop cause I needed to call my dad and he walked up to me and he just tipped up my chin and kissed me on the lips. And it was like, Whoa, what just happened there? Like he took it, like he had always been pretty verbal and, but he had never ever like he'd kissed me on the head, maybe, you know, given me lots of hugs, but never. So this line got crossed and it was like, whoa, whoa, what just happened there? So then I'm just sad that, that my listeners can't see my face right now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, facial expressions like that uh -huh. are what helped me to heal because I told myself for years and years and years, it wasn't that big of a deal, right? Like it wasn't that big of a deal because I wasn't raped. I wasn't her, you know, I wasn't this, I wasn't that. So now I can look at it though and see how boundary crushing that was yeah. and not to mention all the lead up to it, but, but that one kiss and then there were multiple kisses. And then at one point, Samantha and I both spent the night at Greg's house oh. and that night was really, you know, I'm, I'm basically in my mind, in my 15 year old brain, I'm cheating on my boyfriend. I'm part of an adulterous relationship and I'm betraying my best, one of my best friends, right? Ugh. In one night, in one night that I should never have been there. And, and you were 15. And I was 15 and he was 30 and she was, she had turned 17 by then. 
I just want to track him down and beat him to a pulp. Well, thankfully, he's in prison. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, Thankfully, and you know, this is where your um, the warrior spirit that I love so much really comes forth. I mean, you have it anyway, just in talking about you know your uh, journey into all the the, tr the the classes that you've taken, all the the certifications, everything, learning how to ski, well, but learning how to rock climb, all of that. But this is truly the warrior spirit coming out. So <laughs> let it rip, girlfriend. Yeah. So. Samantha and I were still in touch, you know, after he moved away, but it was kind of hard. And, and basically I went to one college and she went to a different college, but her boyfriend was at my college and she, in, he invited her down to visit mm -hmm. and seeing her at this party and everybody's drinking. Right. And she just lost it kind of. And so for 12 years after that night, we didn't really speak at all. We basically completely just, I I felt like she couldn't handle me being in her life. Like I brought too much negativity. Well, it just brought the memories to the exactly. surface and she couldn't handle it. It's a huge it. trigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, we just moved apart and I literally moved across the country and all that stuff. And I, I kind of kept tabs on what she was doing. She was training for the Olympics and pole vaulting. I mean, she was an amazing wow. athlete. Um, but, you know, like, so I, I kind of knew what she was doing and kept in touch. I had her email if I needed it, that kind of thing. But when I hit 30, I called off an engagement and it just rocked me because my parents divorced. It was like getting engaged was to me, I was already married. You know what I mean? It was the biggest, it was amazing that I had gotten engaged. I loved this man so much. But when I called off that engagement, I went down fast and I was like, wow. what is wrong with me? Because it was the first time that I could say, it's not the guy's fault. It's uh -huh. like, there's something wrong with me. And so I started seeing a therapist and then I reached out to Samantha. I just emailed her and I said, Hey, how you doing? Cause I wanted to know if she had done therapy. I wanted to know how she was doing with this in her life. And we basically reconnected and had these very parallel lives. Uh -huh. And then I did the research to find out that our statute of limitations was not up. And I, I knew he was wow. a chiropractor and a physician assistant. Oh my God. And the girls from our gym, our old gym, he had moved back to that area and they were going to see him as patients. Oh my God. And I just couldn't have it, you know, like not on my watch. Like I knew too much. I did not like, if he wasn't doing it anymore, I kind of felt like if we make this report and he's not doing anything anymore, nothing's going to come of it. Right. Cause it's 15 years old. So she's such an amazing woman, Samantha, and, and she had so much more trauma than me, so uh -huh. much more. But she, I basically, we, we locked arms and we just did it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I, I just, I'm, I'm basically, I am on my knees just, you know, <laughs> uh, praising you. Thank you so much for all of the women that you saved and the girls. And if you hadn't done that. He'd still be doing it. He'd <sighs> still be abusing. And oh my God. I know. Wow. It is. It's really, it's a, it's a powerful story because 15 years, you know, it took us 15 years to really own it for what it was. Right. And to go and report it to the police. And it was not easy in any stretch. Oh, I, mean, I could not even begin to imagine. And even when you did, again, you know, I don't know, figuratively or literally lock arms and went to the police together. Yeah. Um, how did they respond to you? How did they, did they take it seriously? Oh did they kind of pee pee poo poo it? Because here you are 15 years later, what right. do these women want from this man? Totally. So wow. what's amazing and I'm so, like gratitude. The first time that I really understood the word gratitude was through this judicial process. So the first detective that I, I called him actually, cause it was, you know, this certain police department and I called and I was like, okay, so what do we need to do? And he was like, well, you have to show up here. I can't take it over the phone. So I had to fly back to Ohio. We got, you were in California. I was in time? California okay. at the time. We got in a car together, Samantha and I, she was in Ohio. So she picked me up at the airport. We drove to this police department. Oh. I had spoken to him. So I knew who I was going to talk to. And then we sat down and we both just hand wrote this story. Like, this is what we remember, where it happened, where we were, who we were with, what time it was, you know, all these places. And, 
And then it sat on the prosecutor's office for about seven months because she was on maternity leave and it was a 15 year old case. They right. weren't going to go arrest somebody for it. But just a month or so after I made the police report, they had wanted Samantha to do like a tap, like go to his office and try and talk to him with a tap. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, no, no. Like you're not doing that to her. I was the one who kind of initiated this and I wanted to protect her as much as I could through mm-hmm. it because like it's just, you know, like I wanted to do this. She didn't necessarily want to do mm-hmm. this. So I said, I'll do a tap phone call to him first. And so I did a tapped phone call, and in that phone call, he admitted to eight or nine counts of oral sex with her. Oh, dear Lord. Which was way an underestimate, but it was a good thing to get recorded, right? You Mm -hmm. know, I mean, like, that kind of nailed it for us, so she didn't have to do any more. Like, we had... I had also saved letters that he had written me that said, Mm -hmm. I kissed you. Destroy this incriminating evidence. And his signature, you know, I mean, like... The audacity. Of... How did you know not to destroy it? I mean, what what told you? Because that's very intuitive on your part to keep so that. So self awareness is something that I must innately have more of than some <laughs> other people. And I never like this is something that I'm just coming to terms with. I think as a teenager, when I got that letter, it's special, right? When you're in that mode of okay. being groomed and being loved by your mm-hmm. coach, who's I, I wasn't going to get rid of that letter. That was my mm-hmm. proof that he did love me, you know, because mm-hmm. the, the most incriminating letter that he wrote was my question to him is, if you love me so much, what about Samantha, right? Because mm-hmm. it's the jealousy factor right. too, right? And so he listed this whole, like, here's how this went down. She kissed me, but I kissed you. And I mean, like, boom. Oh, my goodness. So that's how he was justifying everything? Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. It, and so so I, ke- I kept them. I never necessarily really owned that like oh these these could put him in prison but as I got older I kind of did like I remember like at 25 or 30 or like 25 or 27 you know like in those years learning about medicine right learning about trauma learning about sexual violation and thinking I have letters I remember speaking the words I have letters that could put him in jail and these letters they moved from Ohio to Breckenridge Five times in Breckenridge to Arizona to like all of my clinical rotations. They were with me everywhere I went. So they probably moved at least 18 times in those 15 years, you know? And so I remember going to my therapist's office and taking those letters. And that was the first time that I felt truly validated of like, because he said to me, I need to make a CPS report. And I, I was a mandated reporter at that time, right? Like the intricacies of the human brain fascinate me of how I could see other people as, oh yes, Mm -hmm. I need to make a CPS report, but I couldn't apply it to myself. Well, it was just like we were talking earlier about that, not being able to be objective about yourself. And because of, I think, the process of grooming too, and that was another thing I wanted to talk about a little bit more in depth, because it was definitely a process. It starts out just so subtle, so like... Is that really, am I misinterpreting this? Yeah. And you know yeah. that the perpetrator, Greg in this in this instance, was watching your reactions yeah. and gauging the reaction to see how much further he could go or if he needed to Absolutely. pull back. And so that, that process, it's not just, oh my God, yeah, my skin is starting to crawl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the two things that I've heard as far as feedback from the book that have made me the most excited, mm-hmm. one person after she read it, she came in and we sat together and she was like, I need to see you to tell you these things, you know? And she said, the thing that I love the most about the book is that it's hopeful Mm -hmm. because he is, you know, in prison. But the other thing that someone told me was I never understood grooming until I read your book. Right. So it's such a subtle process, but I've been watching the, um, the documentary about Michael Jackson and I think they are doing a really good job Uh of, laying out how the grooming works and not just grooming me, right? But grooming my parents to trust him. Why was he driving us home from a meet by himself? Because everybody trusted him, right? Like it's not just grooming the victim. It's grooming the victim's family. It's grooming everybody. Well, you would have to. Absolutely. Otherwise you wouldn't be able to get away with it for as long as he did. Absolutely. And it's the same thing with that pastor. Right. It's not just, it's not just the quote unquote, the victim or victims. Yeah. It's It's he's victimizing everybody around them to to buy into this and the first thing you said the first word that really just stuck in my mind was when you said the word charismatic absolutely because most perpetrators are incredibly charismatic people are drawn to them Uh yeah 
Yeah. And absolutely. that always makes my red flags go up. When I see someone who is that charismatic and charming and it's like, hmm, what's yeah. going on here? Mm -hmm. Wow. Absolutely. So the man is in prison. Yes. So we're going to not go through the rest of this. Just yes. Because get the book. <laughs> read the book because it's incredibly enlightening, educational, and it is the message of hope. But I do want to get to the best part is he's in jail. <laughs> yes. Yes. And you know, I, I think about that a lot, how much I healed from the judicial process and how hard it would have been if it would have gone the other way. Right. Right. So I, I totally understand why women don't go forward and don't try and do this, mm -hmm. what we did. But... We had to end up in a five day long jury trial. He was offered a plea deal of four years in prison and 15 years as a registered sex offender and he didn't take it. Wow. He pled not guilty. They capped our case at five victims, although many more were coming forward about him. Mm -hmm. So those five victims, um, three of them got guilty charges and or no, four, four maybe. So that led to the 43 years. So Samantha and I both got guilty verdicts on our cases, charges, yeah. cases, yes. Um, and so, you know, it was really amazing because the detective, you know, that took our first story, the detective that was on the phone call with me, cause mm -hmm. he was like on a three-way call, mm -hmm. those men and, and the, even like the victim witness office and the, the bailiff, uh -huh. they, they were so great. They protected us, but they also made us laugh. Aww. You know, I mean, they were yeah. just, it was just this really incredible experience mm -hmm. of supportive like, after all that time and, and all those years exactly. somebody is really looking Listening out for you and hearing and saying that was wrong and taking yes. action yes and the Jeez. judge you know could have given him you know all the sentences all at once or mm -hmm. he did but he did them consecutively so that it okay. was longer and so he was really standing up for us too and it just felt like this amazing like oh this is how it's supposed to work you know yeah so how old was he at the time that so he was sentenced 45 46 maybe i was 31 or so and then he was <clears throat> given how many years 43 years okay however he has appealed and gotten acquitted for one count of rape so then it dropped to 33 years and oh. he's been in there like 10 or so so when the victims that came forward were mm -hmm. they all gymnasts or no. were they chiropractic patients they were chiropractic his? patients mm -hmm. yes so that's what actually we had our report was sitting on their desk you know mm -hmm. and then a chiropractic patient came forward and made a report and that's what brought him in for questioning and so wow. they, they questioned him on that report specifically and he had his textbooks and explained it all away right but of at course. the end of the couple hours of questioning they dropped mine and samantha's reports on his desk and, uh -huh. and what they told me was that he broke down crying and admitted mm -hmm. it all so oh, he got arrested man. that night yeah really um yeah. so if this woman had not come forward who knows right yeah if she had not come forward and so she didn't know no about no. you and samantha she didn't know nope. any of that she was just her own person she yes. and she found her her voice yes. and she stood her ground yes. and she did the right thing so she's the one who actually opened the doors for everybody else well our combination really and that's uh -huh. what i love like when women come together like the nassar thing was just oh mind oh, blowing oh. right yeah, but I'm just so grateful for those women that have each other now because mm -hmm. I can't imagine not doing this with Samantha, right? Mm -hmm. If it had just been me, I could have talked myself into like, no, it's not worth it. I still love him to the right. point of this. Like, this is what's so crazy about my brain, right? And, and how a traumatic brain, you know, like works in the preparation for the trial. My prosecuting attorney and I were sitting at a table just like this, this uh -huh. close to each other. And she said to me, why did you think that he would talk to you when you did the tapped phone call? And I'm 31, no hesitation. I knew he still loved me and respected me enough to talk to me. And her face did what your face <laughs> did earlier. She just went, oh, like her eyes popped open, her jaw dropped. And I was like, oh. Did you oh. do like a mental head smack? Right. Like, where like, is this coming what? from? Yes. But I mean, that it's so intertwined. I mean... Well, it's well so you're intertwined. again. I just keep going back to the grooming process. I was and a kid. and you're talking about your brain and everything. Totally. And it's uh, you know I'm really into neuroplasticity. That's part of the Feldenkrais training that I've done. And, and you know once you hear something over and over again, you really believe it. And you hear that that message just kept, keeps getting reinforced. Those Absolutely. patterns, those pathways in your brain. And how many years later, all of a sudden, there's the trigger, boom, and it comes out of your mouth. Yeah, exactly.
And it's like, where in the heck is this coming from? And those like little awakening things were so good for me. Like I can kind of look back at a bunch of them, Mm -hmm. but that one was a deal breaker. I was like, oh, and it, it allowed me to two days later, sit on that stand and read those letters that used to make oh, me kind geez. of nauseous. And like the letters that made me want to cry and made me nauseous. I could look at them with this totally different mindset and be like, this is ridiculous. This is a 30 year old man writing to a 15 year old girl. Like I could remove myself uh-huh. from the, what I had still had emotion about, uh-huh. you know, and almost laugh about it. Right. Right. I mean, sadly. Did you feel like a surge of power going through you? Did Huge. you feel just like you know, almost vindicated or like a weight dropped, a weight just dropped from me. Like I had been carrying this around for all these years and her facial expression was like, okay, it's gone. And the vindicator, what you said about vindication, this is so funny, but our hometown paper back in Ohio Uh is called the vindicator. And so I just think it's so interesting because I have these clip outs of like the vindicator and his picture on the front of like, you know, chiropractor arrested for sex crimes. And it's like, what are the odds of that, that our hometown paper is called the vindicator? Isn't that crazy? Yeah. But meant to be. Meant to be for me, for sure. (laughs) I did a podcast, and this was quite a a while back, on um, sexual abuse of physicians, uh, you know, to patients. Mm. I told you about that over Mm -hmm. the phone a long time ago when we first started talking. And the statistics are absolutely mind-boggling. And I'm going to get all worked up, and I'm probably going to have a hot flash, so stand back. (laughs) (laughs) It was the thing... Yeah, it does, especially when I get excited. The thing that just... Oh, I can't even find words for. I'm speechless, which has happened three times in my life before, (laughs) is how many people knew. And I'm not even talking about the victims because, you know, they're dealing with so much trauma, so much head stuff that you can't even think straight or, or... know what steps to take but there was one guy who was a pediatrician his colleagues called him the pedophile pediatrician oh my gosh isn't that disgusting shame on them and i think all of them should be held responsible for not telling so this is the thing this is the thing that's got me so fired up now after writing the book and like really pulling myself out of this and looking at it from a societal conditioning standpoint like this is where it gets really interesting right so i started looking back at like movies from the 80s right Uh and just the societal messaging that i got as an eight-year-old in ghostbusters where the professor is hitting on the student right Right. and that's funny and oh ha ha and then you look at 16 candles and you look at some of these other movies and you're like okay so these are the messages i was getting as a child i didn't get any what i would consider healthy sexual education where somebody said, hey, mm-hmm. you know what? It's illegal for your coach to kiss you. Like nobody yeah, told me that. Right. Not to like not that I didn't know it was wrong. Like in the moment, like I I struggled with it really hard because uh-huh. I did know it was wrong, but the grooming process is, you know, Well and like so... you said, the grooming process even in society and through those movies and stuff. Have right. you ever read the book The Gift of Fear? I have not. Oh my goodness. Okay. It's not one of those things that you read, you know, in one sitting and then go go to bed at night. Yeah. It's you just have to pace yourself because it's a fascinating book and I have talked about that in another podcast and he does talk about things like the grooming process and he was even talking about like certain sitcoms and stuff on television like uh, Cheers which was one of my favorite you know shows when it came out but then he's talking about how you know how he's pursuing her and she's like no 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 and and he was citing several different TV shows and books about how you know women are being pursued and then eventually they're caught and it's like yay but you've got right. to read that book because it starts out pretty it starts starts out pretty hard and then you know it kind of slaps you in the face of a woman who talks about this very charismatic charming man she was trying to carry her groceries up uh, her, to her apartment and you know a bunch of cat food fell out of the bag and he was right there helping her let me carry you this uh, carry this inside for mm-hmm. you and she's thinking that's not right and he you know charmed yeah. his way into carrying the groceries up the stairs into her apartment and brutally raped her. And when he was done, he went into her kitchen to, and she could hear him opening drawers and she intuitively knew that he was looking for a knife to kill her. And she just wrapped a sheet around her, went to the neighbors, knocked on the door and they opened the door and there's this naked woman wrapped in a sheet. They took her in, they called the police and they were able to, you know, catch him. And he had raped several women and killed them 
by yeah. stabbing them to death with a knife. Oh so gosh. that's how the book starts out. So don't mean to be a spoiler, you know. Um, but anyhow, it's kind of rough. But then yeah. he starts out after that incident and talking about talking to her and, and listening to her story. He starts with a simple, uh, air quotes here, right. simple stalking. Hmm. And how, you know, they do the, the stalking, the grooming, and mm -hmm. what they're looking for, and what kind of a response that they want. And I actually had um, a BFF, this is another podcast, I broke up with my best friend of 30 years, that mm -hmm. how do you tell somebody after 30 years, you haven't liked them for the past 15, been trying to break up with them for the past 10. But her, her husband was really creepy too, and mm -hmm. he had actually sent me this letter that was so disgusting. I mean, it was kind of like an obscene letter that he left and put it in my mailbox. And you're, you've been to my house, you know, you don't just, oh, hey, I'm on the way to King Supers. I think I'll stop right here and drop this off. Right. You had to really, you know, intentionally come to my house. And it was so disgusting. And I took it to a therapist that I had been seeing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was just kind of like my weaning off from therapy therapist. And he's like, oh, you know, I think he just probably had a crush on you. And he's sad. He can't see you anymore. And I don't think it's that big of a deal and blah, blah, blah. And I looked at him and I says, did you ever read the book, The Gift of Fear? And he said, no, I haven't. Tell me about it. And I says, I think before you ever give that kind of advice to another woman, yes. you need to sit down and you need to read that book. And yeah. then I left and I went back to my first therapist uh -huh. and I says, okay, and I, I quit seeing him because he was always trying to give me my money's worth. And every time he did, mm. he would trigger me and I would dissociate. And it was like, wait a minute, who's the idiot here? So, you know, and I just said, I just want you to read this. And the look on his face and his reaction, I said, finally, you gave me my money's worth. Yeah. And I said, do I have a stalker? Is this a problem? And he said, no, I don't think he's stalking you. He says, but I think it's more like, um, you know, uh, what's a somebody who exposes himself oh yeah. yeah he's you know he opened up his coat and showed and oh, you know exposed himself verbally. to you yeah. yeah and he wants to see your reaction yeah and then i said well you know the gift of fear that's i'm just reaction. yeah that's his reaction <laughs> and i ignored it i just gave the letter to my attorney he says keep this for me just in case i need yes. it because i don't even yeah. want it in my home yeah so anyway tell us what you're doing now <laughs> okay well so I have my first keynote speech um, starting in, in April 4th. So April is Sexual Violation Awareness Month. And, mm -hmm. and that's kind of my new message, or not new message, but the message that I've been able to come to is that we, we there's a ton of victims, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we are all affected by this, whether like we're actual victims or like you said, all the people who knew about it, they uh -huh. have collateral damage too. Like, they do. All the men that I dated, the guilt that people hold for not saying something when they could have all that, every single human is affected uh -huh. by this. So as victims, I think we really need to own our stories, you mm -hmm. know, and heal our stories. But in order to prevent stories for the next generation, mm -hmm. all of us need mm -hmm. to be able to see these red flags and, and, expose them for what they right. are before the Larry Nassar shit can happen. Excuse right. me. No, that's fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because the, the, like, the Larry Nassar thing has been interesting. They did a podcast called Believed, and it was fascinating because so many healthy, normal people uh -huh. were at least suspicious at least and then and then people were making reports and they were getting denied. And just just because somebody's an MD does not make them safe, you know, just mm -hmm. because somebody's a gymnastics coach, just be, mm -hmm. there's no one is immune to this. And, and honestly, what was really fascinating about writing the book mm -hmm. is I came to a place of love for my coach again, mm -hmm. because I can see that men are being groomed to be these people to right. some degree. Right. If they don't have the right support system, you know, right. when they're growing up as boys, if they have abuse themselves that exactly. they never get healed from, they're set up to do this. So exactly. we, as a, as a big picture society, have to make some serious shifts. Yeah. And if it's as simple as, and this is what's been really interesting, is I've been di diving into the race topic a lot too, uh -huh. and it's helping me to have different language to talk to my husband about it. Mm -hmm. Because when someone offends me, like mm -hmm. his college roommate or something, I feel like it's way more powerful for my husband to call that man out on it than uh -huh. it is for me. Uh -huh. Because coming from a woman, it feels like, oh, what you, you know, we're just kidding, blah, blah, blah. But it's it's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Like some of the just banter that we mm -hmm. hear is completely disgusting See, and unacceptable. that's when the art of the ninja comes in. <laughs> because even as a woman, I want to be the one to tell him. Yeah. Because I can do it in a way that is very, you know, forthright and, you know, not angry. Yeah. But you could even tell in the delivery that I am cutting your heart out. 
<laughs> and I'm doing it with nice. a smile on my face. So and I attribute that and I'm going to give a praise and thank you for the many magnificent men in my life who taught me that skill. Yeah. Or I think I always had it. But we, And I think as women, we do have that ability. Absolutely. But we're told not to use it. Absolutely. And that's, yeah. So there's a, because mm-hmm. de- I've always been the one who will call them out, right? Right. But I guess lately I've seen that I actually, I want to see my men, my strong, amazing men in my life, Mm -hmm. speaking up for us because Mm -hmm. we shouldn't have to. There are good men in the world that Mm -hmm. can see this clearly, but they're kind of quiet on these topics. Mm -hmm. Well, I think they need to find their voice too. Absolutely. And maybe I can beat it out of them. And that's part of it, right? (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, it's us because we are the ones who are going to teach them because they don't see it because... They're men. Exactly. And exactly. they're not victimized as nearly as often as not we are. Not nearly as much. And yeah. I think that's why on some levels, Oprah did a like a interview with the director of the Leaving Neverland uh-huh. documentary. Right. So, But this, she said, that just blew my mind. She said, I've done 217 episodes on sexual violation. And you were able to do something in four hours that I couldn't have done in mm-hmm. 17. I think that part of that is because it's men. Mm-hmm. So it's men that were being abused and it's men that were abusing. So I think that culturally for us is so much less acceptable than a man abusing a woman. Wow. Even yeah. with the, the age difference and everything. Yes, they were children. But like there's something about it being a man on a boy that gets people's attention to some Rather than a degree. man on a girl. Right. Oh, that's right. just disgusting. And I'm just, I don't know, but that's that's what landed with yeah. me when Oprah said that. I thought... Oh, that makes me mad. You know, that makes me mad that she mm-hmm. did 217 episodes mm-hmm. and she feels like this man somehow got it out better, you know? Yeah. Because oh. Oprah's been an advocate for years, uh, years and, and years, years and years and years. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, you know, we're going to wrap things up. I want you to just <laughs> end this with telling people how they can get your book, how they can find you online. And then I'd like for you to come back and talk about your business. Oh my gosh, about I would love that. Homeopathy and stuff sure. because, uh, yeah, we can segue into a different er- area. So go ahead and tell people how the name of your book, the title of it, and how to find it. Sure. So the book is called No Big Deal. <sighs> Very appropriately, yeah. right? No Big mm-hmm. Deal by Tori Ivanic. Mm-hmm. And it's on Amazon. Mm-hmm. And my new business too is called open space. So if you Mm -hmm. want to be a member of that, there's a group on Facebook Mm -hmm. and also I'm launching a program in April that is called the unstoppable deep dive. And it's sort of how I healed. So if it's something that you want to dig into a little bit more, that'll Mm -hmm. be coming out too. Is that going to be on your website? It will be. So it's open space. And then the number four.com open space com is my most recent website. Okay. And we're going to have all of these links are going to be included on the podcast so people can see that and find you and all that stuff. So Tori, Oh my God, I tell you, this has been, (laughs) Woo! So powerful. I'm going to have to smudge my computer after we get this done. But this is just such a remarkable story. I, I, I applaud you. I am in awe of you and your courage and your strength and your warrior spirit. I thank you so much for what you've done. Thank you so much for allowing me to come today. And thank you for being a warrior as well. Okay. Well, and thanks for being so patient and trying to get this on because we really did struggle with our schedules. So for my listeners, thank you so much for listening. And please, really, the key point I think that we want you to take away from this is when you see something, say something. If something has happened to you, find your voice, take the appropriate action. If it was not for Tori's action and Samantha's action, together with the woman in the chiropractic office who said, this isn't, I'm not gonna deal with this or I'm not gonna put up with this, Mm -hmm. this is wrong. Mm -hmm. So find your voice, stand your ground, and let's stop this now. So thank you for listening. As always, I really appreciate your comments and your input and stay safe out there. Keep your eyes peeled, get the book, The Gift of Fear. It's very educational. Until next time, bye now. And that's a wrap on another episode of the Femininja Project. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, be safe, be strong, and until next time, bye now.